Good questions. Okay. Um, so let's look at some things we can do with pattern. Okay, so the first thing is that uh, we can use uh, a match expression in about the same way that a uh, that languages like C use a switch statement. So here's an example. Suppose I want to write a function called in bowl uh, that takes a character as an argument. And I want it to return true if my if C is a lowercase vowel, and I want it to return false otherwise. So what I can do is I can use a match, and then I can just have uh, a pattern here that matches each vowel, A, E, I, O, U. Let's say Y is not a vowel. And in each case, I want to return true. actually an E there, believe it or not. That's actually trying to make it look like an E. <laughs> okay. Um, and this conceivably could be implemented very efficiently. Um, the way that a, a switch statement works in a language that has them is that in fact um, the compiler figures out the, uh, the address of the code that handles each possible branch on the switch. And then when it sees what it's supposed to match on, it just jumps to that address and executes the, executes the code there. It doesn't have to do a series of comparisons like you would in an if then else. So it is at least possible that the, the no capital compiler could do the same thing. So this could actually be very efficient. And maybe if you've got, you know, like a hundred different uh, possible simple branches, each of which are indicated by a constant, this could actually be quite fast. Okay, that makes sense? Uh, you can also <coughs> do something sort of related. Let's say I want to write a function called uh, isDigit. And it's going to take a, uh, let's say it takes a, an integer i. Okay. Well, what's a digit? Uh, a digit is just a, an integer, let's say, from 0 to 9 inclusive. So what I can do is I can write 0 dot dot 9 and have that return true. And anything else, I can return false. And note here that it's two dots, not three. Um, why is it two dots? I can think of it, uh, you know, why not three? I can think of at least two explanations. Uh, one is that if you have three dots, it might be uh, easier to parse, easier for the compiler to understand in some sense, because then it doesn't have to worry about maybe one of those dots means a, um, uh, like a, a dot in a, in a real number, a real constant. The other possibility is that uh, that can be uh, but there's a dead programming language called Pascal that was used in the 1970s and 1980s, and it used two dots to indicate ranges of constants. So, you know, you could talk about, like, you could say, like, if uh, you wanted to have an array whose indexes were 1 to 10, you could say 1 dot dot 10 inside the array declaration. Uh, nobody uses Pascal anymore, as far as I know, but the uh, some of its notation may survive. Okay, and this only works for constants that have a um, a well-defined ordering. So that's going to be something like integers, characters. Um, I suppose you could do it with booleans, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it does not work with strings. I'm pretty sure it does not work with um, real constants. Okay, uh, does that make sense? Questions about that? Okay, so what other cool things can you do with pattern matching? <laughs> well, 
Um, I made this claim that pattern matching is everywhere. What does that mean? It means that everywhere we give names values. Everywhere that we give names values. Uh, we can use pattern matching. And in particular, we can use it as in the parameters of functions. Okay, so you might remember the, uh, the head and tail functions that work with lists. So remember, head gives you the first element of a list, tail gives you a list of everything but the first, uh, everything but the first element. We can write that like so. We can say something like A cons B. Okay, and this, remember, is uh, here I'm using this as a pattern that matches a list whose first element is A and whose remaining elements are B. I can say, all right, in that case, I want to return A. And I can say, and I would, I would do that if, if for some reason head was not defined. Okay, similarly, I can do something like this. And here I'll get B. So presumably, um, it's possible that somewhere down in the guts of OCaml, that head and tail are actually defined that way. Okay, you might also remember the functions first and second that took um, that work with two tuples. We you used those in that lab where you had to compute the value of E with rational arithmetic. Okay. Well, we can put a two tuple here, uh, and so if so, there if I call first with a two tuple, I get a, I get a, and if I call second here with a two tuple, I get b. All right, and note that it's if I try to call one of these functions with something that simply doesn't match its argument, uh, then I get a compile time error. So like if I tried to call head with something that's not a list, or second with something that's not a two tuple, uh, well the computer can figure out that that pattern cannot possibly match, and then I get an error back. Okay, so uh, pattern matching is everywhere. Okay, does that make sense? What's good about that? Okay, and in fact, uh, this is the reason why we can have, if we want a function with no arguments. Let's say I want a function that has, takes no arguments and always returns five. Why would I want that? I have no idea. But I could have, but I can have a function with no arguments. That's why I can put this unit object here to indicate uh, that there's no that there's no arguments, even though OCaml thinks all functions have one argument, okay? And so then if I wanted to call this, I would say something like that, and this unit object would match that pattern, and I would get back a five. Uh, now, I probably would write a function that returns five in this way, that's kind of silly, but I might want to write a function that takes no arguments. And if I wanted to do that, that's, that's how I would do it. Okay, uh, does that make sense? This can actually be carried to absurd lengths. Um, so let's say, um, let's write uh, absurd um, function parameters, uh, parameter matching. Okay, I can write a function called 17 that can only be called with the number 17. Let's say it returns zero. Okay, um, all right, so 17 is a perfectly good pattern. It matches only the digit, only the number 17. So I can call this function with the literal integer constant, 17, and I get back a value. But if I call it with anything else, I get a compile time error. 
Why would I want to do that? And the answer is, I have no idea. Um, probably I never would. But it, it, is at least, it, it is at least possible. I can at least have a function that can be called with, uh, with, only, with only one argument in this way. Okay. Um, that makes sense? How, how would you call that? I, I call it, I call it 17 with an argument 17. And that, that's the, and that's the only call that, that uh, OCaml will like, by the way. Other questions? Okay, but this actually is, okay, this is actually kind of useful because I can also use a mechanism very similar to this to have functions that return multiple values. Let's call these multiple value functions. Okay, so let's say I want to write a function that's called head tail. So HDTL, head tail, that's all one word. And what, what do I want it to do? I want it to take a list, and then I want it to return both the head and tail of that list. So I can write something like this. Here's a pattern. All right, we, we agreed up here that this is a, a pattern that matches a list whose head is A and whose tail is B. Same thing here. And then what I could do is I could return a two-tuple that contains A and B, where A is the head and B is the tail. Now I've got a function that effectively can return more than one value. And so I might, I could call it directly and get a tuple back, but I could also call it with a let. So I could say something like let x, y equals head and tail, and I don't know, let's, uh, a fake example here. Let's say I call that with one, two, three. Okay, then what happens is that x gets bound to one, and y gets bound to the list two, three. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, I've, uh, I, I sort of get uh, pattern matching is giving me sort of a um, mechanism for returning functions with multiple values if I want. Uh, and I sort of get that for free. Um, so I, I complain a lot about OCaml, but this is actually, uh, this is actually something I like about the language. This use of pattern matching is actually sort of cool. Uh, and that should be taken as, what I'm doing here, just sort of a list of cool things you can do with pattern matching. Uh, okay, um, any questions about that? Go ahead. Would you like to raise an error um, with just a lot? Uh, with just, so like, give me, give me an example. Like, for 17, could you do like, um, that statement for like some of the students that would raise error or something that would not Um, well, but, okay, so, the, the problem with this function, the 7D function, is that it's practically useless. Because if I, if I even so much as try to call it with something other than the integer constant 17, um, OCaml will give me some kind of an error or a warning. Okay, so I, I, now I suppose what I could do is I could say, well, I could define it so that it raises an exception. Uh, but then, still, I can only call it with the number 17, with literally that number. So, um, it, it's not like we're testing for that at runtime. The compiler is actually pattern matching during compilation and it's testing for it at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, other, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, other questions? Don't, don't go out and write functions with numbers as parameters. That, that's just silly. Uh, and, uh, and unless you're just really smart and figure out a use for it, and then tell me, because I can't think of it. Okay. Um, well, that's, that's all I really wanted to say about pattern matching. Uh, so let's get on to something a little more interesting. Um, okay. So what I want to do is uh, talk about functions and environments and a data structure that is and closures. A closure is a uh, data structure that exists inside OCaml 
that represents a function. Uh, we don't have direct access to closures, but um, OCaml creates them and uses them internally, but we can talk about how they work. Okay, so I wanna open the, uh, my discussion here of why we need something like closures with the following example. Let's say I write a little bit, and this is not realistic code, by the way, although I will get to some. Let's say I've got, I want to define from top level here, I want to say uh, let D equals one. Okay, so cool, now I've got a name D that's bound to one. Okay, and then let's say I also want to write a function called add D. So that's, uh, uh, the first two D's are part of the word add, and the last D is for D. And what does it do? Well, let's say it takes a parameter and it adds n plus d. Okay, so at this point, we ought to guess that if we called add d with three, we should get back four, right? That makes sense? Okay, now, uh, let's see if we can do something a little more, a little more interesting. Okay, uh, let's say I let d equals two, and I say in add d of three. Okay, and now my, my question for the audience here is, what do I get? Well, it seems to me like there's maybe two reasonable possibilities. One is that since d equals two, and I call add d with three, I might get five. Another possibility is since I get, since d was one when the function was created, and I add, and I call it with three, maybe I should get four. Okay, and so there's sort of two possible answers here. So let's, let's try to scare the audience. If, if you feel brave, uh, or even if you don't, how many, how many people think you might get five? Okay, there's a few people. How many think you might get four? A few more people. And the rest of you are just scared, or, or, or prudent, perhaps. Okay, all right, it turns out, turns out that the answer you get is four. Okay, uh, why is that? All right, well, there's a phrase here that explains what is going on. And we say that functions closed themselves in their defining environments. Okay, so you might wonder, well, well what does that mean? Okay, well, what we have here is an environment Uh, an environment is something, let's say it's defined as, it's, it's like a data structure that's used internally by the compiler. And what it does is it records the bindings of bindings of all names. Okay, now uh, that maybe not all, maybe really just names that are relevant in a particular situation, but if, you, if we want to say that it's all, we can go with that. Okay, so what happens here is at this point, as soon as we have bound D to one, the environment says D equals one. And when I create this function add, add d, what happens is that it remembers the environment, the environment. That was current. When it was defined. So what happens here is that add d uh, remembers that it was defined in an environment where d equals one. And so that means that forever after, 
Whenever I call add D, if D, if add D needs the value of D, it will use the D that existed when it was defined. It does not use the D that existed when the function was called. Right? There's an environment at this point. Okay, I mean, here's an environment that says the D equals two. All right, uh, that's what let does. Let creates an environment temporarily. Well, okay, that's not the environment that add D uses. By the way, there's names for both of these. Uh, what this situation here is where we remember the environment that was currently defined. That is called static binding. All right. Um, and you know, yeah, yet another word, yet another use of the word static in computer science, right? I mean, there's at least half a dozen definitions of the word static. What it means in this case is that the value that D has is determined statically uh, just by looking at the code. You don't have to think about how the code, where the code is executed. You can simply look at the way it was defined. Uh, the people who thought this would be five, this is called fluid binding, sometimes also called dynamic binding. And almost no modern languages use this. Uh, that turns out to be easier to implement than static binding. Uh, and so there are some early programming languages that did it, just because people didn't know any better at the time, but almost no modern language still uses that. There is, uh, there is a, an exception. There's, there's a dialect of Lisp, which remember I talked about early in the course, that's called Common Lisp. And Common Lisp actually has both static and dynamic bindings. Um, so if you want, you can actually tell common list that you want a variable to have dynamic binding and it will do that for you. That's about the only modern language that's left that still does that. Okay, um, does that make sense so far? Questions about environments and binding strategies? Go ahead. So fluid binding is the one that would give us five. That's the one where you look up the value of D in the, in, in the calling environment. Uh, not what OCaml does. OCaml looks up the value of D in the defining environment. Okay, other questions? Does that make sense? In the back, go ahead. Uh, so I guess, how do you figure out the parameters of, or the, the boundaries of what an environment is? Because like, um, <coughs> this was an imperative language and D was allowed to be changed. I would assume it would be five, not because of the status binding, but because D is. Well, actually, in an imperative language, it works the same way. Uh, um, uh, Python, for example, does the same thing. Um, but how do you figure it out? You look at the code. So here, I, I look at this code, and I see, well, where, where does it get N from? Well, that's a parameter. That's OK. Where does it get D from? Well, that means it's inherited D somehow using the value of D that was created when it's defined. So now I look up here in the rest of my code and I see, ah, here's D equals one. So that means I'm getting this D from here, okay? Uh, but you have, you have to read the code to figure that out. Now, this is a really simple example, so it's really easy to find out where D is coming from. But in something more complicated, maybe you'd have to, maybe you'd have to read more or think harder. Uh, did that answer your question? I think so. Okay. Other questions? Yes, go ahead. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna rebind I'm gonna rebind left there at that point. Then then when this function is defined, then d equals two. It remembers d equals two. It's, it's using the current binding of D in each case. Let's, let's erase this so that uh, it doesn't get us into trouble.
That is go KK compilers course. Um, short answer, um, which is getting a little ahead of myself. To do dynamic binding, what you do is you search the stack when you see a variable that you've inherited and you find the first definition of that variable on the stack and you use that. When you are doing static binding, when you create a function, you have to have a data structure that remembers the environment. And that's a little bit harder to do. Um, not a lot harder to do, but a little bit harder to do. Um, we'll, we'll talk, uh, if there's time, we'll talk about that a little more today. But that's, uh, without, without dropping into a compiler design lecture, that's the best I can do at the time. Can, can we go over that? Yeah. Okay, somebody else, go ahead. Well, we had that many people and we shared the DB core. If we had not? Yeah, like we had DB core compiler and throw it. No, then, then, then you get a compile time error. Okay. Uh, then OCaml starts to cry and it says, um, you know, boo hoo hoo, you haven't defined D. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the, the language will not let you do that. Uh, but good question. Other questions? All right. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, why why do we want to do this? Why is why is uh, dynamic why is static binding a good idea? Well, it turns out one of the things we'll see is you can do lots of cool things with it. But uh, but the example that I want to give is that is going to involve this is that you can pass functions as arguments to other functions. Okay, so in, in an applicative language, what happens is functions are really kind of like data. And you can pass them as arguments to other functions. And in addition, you can return functions. You can return functions. Functions as values from other functions. Okay. And so what happens is that in both cases here, static binding uh, helps support this. Helps support this. Okay. Um, so at this point, let me try a realistic example. Um, so let's say I want to uh, write, uh, by the way, functions that do this, uh, these are called higher order functions. Uh, higher order, that's a term that computer scientists have stolen from mathematical logic, right? Uh, mathematicians build castles in the air and computer scientists try to live in them. And, all right, and so in logic what happens is a, uh, in usual mathematical logic we can have relations between uh, objects, between data, well, but in, in what's called higher order logics, we can have relations between relations. So, okay, so that's where the word higher order comes from. If we can have functions that act up, that operate on functions, those are higher order. So let's just try something for a second. Let's imagine that I want to define a function called for each. And I'm not gonna tell you, I will show you what for each is in a minute or two but um, not quite yet. And let's say, let's say I want to define a function called add one here first. So I'm gonna say add one and, and you guessed it, it adds one to n. Okay, now let's say I have a function called for each. Uh, and I want to call it with add one and maybe a list of elements. Let's say one, two, and three. 
Okay, so here what's happening is I'm, I'm passing a function as an argument to another function. I'm passing add one as an argument to for each. What I want for each to do is I want this to return a list where this calls add one of one, add one of two, add one of three. So in other words, what I should get back is two, three, four. All right, so my, my for each function, what I want it to do, I want it to take a function and a list, and I want it to apply the function to every element of the list, and then I want to return a list of what it gets back. Okay, does that make sense? I'm gonna define for each here in a, in a second, but let's just make sure it's clear as to what it's supposed to do. Okay, I guess we're good. Okay, so here's my function for each. Okay, so it's going to take two arguments. Uh, func, by the way, I can't call it function because the word function is actually a reserved word in, reserved name in OCaml. Um, I, I haven't used that for anything, but if you're curious about it, you can look it up in Hickey's book. And let's say it takes a, a list which I'm gonna call objects, okay? Because it could be a list of anything, as long as it's consistent with function. Okay, well this is gonna be one of these functions that has an internal helper. So I'm gonna call it, at a slight abuse of English, I'm gonna call it for eaching. And func is never gonna change while for eaching is running. So I want for eaching to just inherit func. I don't want it to do anything, but objects might. So I'll have objects called here. Okay, and then what I'll do is I'll call, I want to match on objects. Okay, if objects is the empty list, I want to get back another empty list. If it's not the empty list, then I want to break objects into two parts. Its first element I want to call other object, and its remaining elements I want to call other objects. Okay, and we've seen how to do that. We've seen how, how that works right in some other examples that, that use lists. Okay, so what do I want to do? I want to call func, whatever it happens to be, on other objects. And then I want to cons the result onto whatever I get back from for eating on other objects with an S. All right. So, by the way, this is not a tail recursion. The last thing it does is not call for eating. The actual last thing it does is actually to run this cons. And so here we'll set up for eating with objects. Okay, and so that's that's my higher order function that does what I wanted that that, uh, that does what I wanted to. Now, uh, how does this work? How does this work internally? Well, what happens is that if I was to call for each with add one and a list, what happens is that func gets bound to add one temporarily. So inside this function, it looks as if func is actually add one. Okay, and so now when I call func here, I'm really calling add one, although I'm sort of going through a kind of intermediate name here. And whatever other object is, that's gonna be an integer, I'm gonna get back whatever I get by adding one to it. And I'm gonna cons that onto whatever I get by calling for eaching on the other objects. Okay, so I want to claim that for each is a higher order function, <coughs> excuse me, that works like this. Okay, um, does that, uh, any questions about that? Does that make sense? Go ahead. So with the pattern um, other objects, um, cons other objects? That's this one, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's Yes, 
Uh, yeah, this is always going to be the head, this is going to be the tail. Uh, other questions? Okay, now, uh, let's imagine that I was trying to define this in a language that had dynamic binding. Dynamic binding is the one where we look up the value of variables, and we look up the value of names based on the calling environment. Okay, and so let's say that I had a function here. What if func uses the name other object or other objects or object? All right. So func is using is using that name somehow. So in other words, under dynamic binding, let's say in dynamic binding. Okay, what would happen? Well, I expect func to, uh, you know, uh, func might actually be able to see this variable, or it might be able to see objects, or it might be able to see other objects, and it shouldn't be able to do that. Um, so if I was using dynamic binding and I wanted higher order functions, I would have to be really careful that the function that I pass to another function didn't have names that would conflict. So I would have to make sure that whatever this function was didn't know, didn't use any of these other names. And this is a phenomenon that's called name capture. And this is bad, okay. Um, and by the way, this is bad news. If I had something like this. Because maybe name capture would make uh, this function not work properly. All right. Uh, fortunately though, if we have um, static binding, we never need to worry about that. Okay, because name capture cannot happen. The only place that a function will get names that it inherits are from its defining environment, not its calling environment. Okay, and so this is one reason why static binding is much nicer than dynamic binding. Okay, does that make sense? Questions about that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just to get it straight, instead I would suppose we had a different function that uses objects as a parameter and uses that as a uh -huh. uh, there's a chance that due to this uh, name capture in a dynamic binding environment that, uh, I mean, the function the will use the value of the object stored in this calling environment there mm -hmm. in a reverse computation. And that might jeopardize the process. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, using it as a parameter probably isn't going to hurt anything, but if it inherited the value, if it inherited that name from someplace, that might. Okay, so I would have to make sure, for example, that func didn't use other object or other objects. And there's no reason that I should have to do that. Uh, let's consider, for uh, as an example, let's suppose I had a whole library of higher order functions. And in fact, I, I do. Okay, uh, well look, I would have to make sure that the functions that I used with those didn't cause name captures. That's an unreasonable thing for me to have to worry about. All right, so it, just with this, I mean, even, even if we just had this, this is a good reason for having, for having static binding rather than dynamic binding. Okay, um, questions about that? Other questions? Okay. Um, by the way, there's a, there's a related thing here that doesn't really have to do with um, with binding strategies. Um, but it does have to do with higher order functions. And this is something that are called, that's called anonymous functions. Uh, an anonymous function is, these are functions without names. Okay, well, let's, let's just think for a second here. 
why should every function have a name? Uh, uh, if, if we're going to go with this idea that functions are really just a funny kind of data, um, well, other kinds of data don't have to have names. I mean, look, if I want the integer 17, I can just write it. I don't have to give it a name. Or if I want to have a string hello, all right, I can just write that. I don't have to give it a name, um, all right? Uh, unless you, you think that, you know, it has a name in sort of a mathematical sense. I don't have to give it a name that's like a word. So why should a function have to have a name? Well, it turns out it doesn't. And I can define an anonymous function in OCaml like this. All right. So this is, if I write this, and I always like to put parentheses around uh, when I do that, because I think it makes things easier to read. And it also doesn't cause as much trouble with the rest of the language. This returns an anonymous function, a function without a name, whose parameters are the P's, and whose body, body is of course the part that's computed to return a value, is E, where E is some expression. By the way, the P's can be patterns. Remember, pattern matching is everywhere. So for example, I had this example before where I defined a function called add one, that you got it, adds one, and then I've got, and then I called for each with it. Well, hmm, you know, maybe this is the only place in my program where I ever use add one. Hold on just a second. Uh, so why should I have to give add one a name? Uh, if I have an anonymous function, I can write something like this. I can say for each fun n arrow n plus one. One, two, three. This is the same example I did before. And I get back two, three, four. Okay. Um, so here, here's an anonymous function. Now, this notation is kind of upsetting to me because it uses an arrow, and the arrow, uh, the arrow actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense there because the arrow is really used with pattern matching. Uh, with, is used with, with a, a match with. Here it seems to me like it shouldn't be an arrow. But again, I didn't design this language, uh, so I'm not responsible for it. I just, uh, they just pay me to teach it. Uh, so that's the notation we have to use. And you had a question, go ahead. What's the fun keyword? That's the fun keyword. That fun is short for function. <coughs> that, that's all I can say. Um, maybe it's um, maybe it's an attempt by OCaml to the designers of OCaml to make their language look amusing. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, you have to say fun. Did that? Did that? Is that what you were asking? Okay. So what happens is we can define anonymous functions. By the way, anonymous functions behave exactly like ordinary functions. They they close themselves in their defining environment in exactly the same way. Okay, so if I wanted to add, uh, let's say, D to something, I could replace that one by a D, and it would use the current binding of D, whatever, whatever that is. Okay, the, uh, we can do almost anything with anonymous functions that we can do with ordinary functions. The only thing is they can't call themselves. The only, um, right, because in order for them to call themselves, they have to have a name and they don't have a name, okay? So, um, but these are often more convenient in situations where we've got a function that is only going to be used once. We don't have to invent a name for it. Okay, uh, we got about a minute left. Any questions about any of this stuff? Don't leave yet. I know you want to, but don't leave yet. Okay, so uh, what are we going to do with this? Um, 
So next week, what we're going to do is look at uh, a couple of things. Uh, what's a closure look like? What's actually in a closure? Uh, so I want to talk about that. Um, at some point later in the course, we're actually going to see a way that we can 